hello, this is my cat Sable, and I don't think I've ever made a video this close to one another, but I had more to say about Hengzimun. So here we go. Basically, the last time I talked about Hengzimun, I talked a lot about the structure of the book, and how the structure can be best described as a reverse Bildungsroman. Reverse Bildungsroman meaning a Bildungsroman is traditionally a coming of age story where you see a character spiritually uh, and physically grow throughout the story, but that in this novel you do not see uh, Natalie grow. In fact, you see her become a more definitive version of who she was on page one, and that you see more of a mental spiral. Um, today, I want to talk more about trauma and how trauma is presented in this book. Um, very specifically, I'm going to be referencing sexual trauma. Um, I guess if you have any triggers, this is your warning to hop out of the hop off the video. Uh, with that being said, let's dive on it. So. This book was written in 1951, and as I said, it's it's a reverse building among a coming of age story about Natalie Waite and it's her mental spiral as she goes to as she transitions from being you know uh, this child at home to being a college student, and arguably one of the factors that played into spiral was being assaulted by a family friend right before she went away to college. However, this is played very subtly. Jackson, cho Shirley Jackson chooses to omit the details of the crime and instead of giving us flashbacks or a drawn out scene or even really a reference to what has happened, she focuses on how it affects Natalie, and the focus is turned on Natalie's increasingly agonizing social isolation because her mind is just delving into this fantastical alternate reality. The beginning of the novel suggests that Natalie has always struggled with finding her place in the world, but this assault is what truly makes her just fall into madness. The traumas left her fundamentally marred, and the novel's incredible closing line, Natalie was now alone and grown up and powerful and not at all afraid, is Natalie's sense of resolution. She has changed forever, and she believes this is for the better, in a way. So, let's go back. It is probably around, like, I'm gonna say you got a book that's this thick. It's around here, so like not quite a third of the way through, um, is when the scene at the house party occurs. It is when Natalie is assaulted by an unknown, an unnamed, I should say, an unnamed family friend. It's a man, and we're not given a name or a physical description. We know he's a fa her father's friend, but other than that, he exists as this intimidating other. She's kind of, as the party's going, she's kind of moving around, talking to, like kind of getting sucked into these conversations with other people, just how you awkwardly do at family parties. And she becomes locked in a conversation with him. Uh, he he grabs her by her arm and he pulls her away from the crowd and across the grass uh, because he seems to want to talk to her alone. As they walk into the woods, she says aloud, I used to play here when I was a child. And it's this one moment where she suddenly feels comfort in where she is. It's kind of this reminder of like, I'm not in a bad place. I'm not, even though there's this intimidating other with her, this is a familiar location. This is where she played as a child. But 
nonetheless, she does quickly realize what's going on when he is talking to her. And she kind of realizes, he says, let's sit down here. Uh, looking up as she did immediately, she saw the immeasurable space traveling past the locked hands of the trees, past the large nodding and placeable heads up and into the silence of the sky where the stars remained indifferent. Tell me what you thought was so wonderful about yourself, the man said. His voice was muted. Oh, dear God, sweet Christ, Natalie thought so sick and she nearly said aloud. Is he going to touch me? And that is where cuts to the next day on that closing line. And I did forget to mention that is why he dragged her away, because he seemed to be offended when she said that she was thinking of herself. Um, yeah. So he kind of is, here it is. Uh, and coincidentally, there's, there's a lot to unpack with this. She's also having these sort of this mental break or this daydream about a detective who is accusing her of murder, essentially. I talked about that in the last video. The man is trying to pull her aside, saying like, so your father tells me you're quite the little writer as though he might have been saying, a Girl Scout patrol leader or top of your grade in algebra, obviously meaning to make her sound less like her mother and more like a frightened girl not yet in college. So he's already talking down to her. She's all half in her daydream, half offended by that. He says, are you thinking about yourself? Said the detective, have you given any thought to the extreme danger of your position? What about the knife? I'm thinking about how wonderful I am, Natalie said. She smiled. Now I can get up and walk away, she thought. The faster, the better. She started to get up, but the man got up first and took a hold of her arm. About how wonderful she is, he said, as though to himself, thinking about how wonderful she is. And that's the moment he takes her away. So, so much to unpack with that. Um, she's trying to defend herself against, again, this intimidating other. It's not given any real description, but you know that he makes her feel small, or he thinks of her as small. And she is trying to outwit. She's trying to hold her game. And she, I say trying, but I feel like saying that makes it sound as though she wasn't confident. And I think she did hold a sense of confidence to herself up until he pulled her away. And he takes her away, and he's offended by the fact that she's thinking about how wonderful she is. He's offended that she thinks highly of herself. And that's how it ends. The Back to the line, is he going to touch me? And then it just cuts to the next morning, and she's waking up in bed, and she does not immediately recall what happened. She's just, as far as she's concerned, she woke up. And when the memories of the... She woke the next morning to a bright sun and clear air, to the gentle movement of her bedroom curtains, to the pattern dancing on the light of the floor. She lay quietly appreciating the morning in the clear, uncomplicated moment, occasionally before consciousness returned. This one moment of safety. Then with the darkening of the sunlight, the sudden coldness of the day, she was awake and before perceiving clearly why, she buried her head into her pillow and said half aloud, no. I will not think about it. It does not matter, she told herself, and her mind repeated idiotically. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Until, desperately, she said aloud, I don't remember. Nothing happened. Nothing happened that I remember. Slowly, she knew she was sick. Her head ached. She was dizzy. She loathed her hands as they came to her face to cover her eyes. Nothing happened, she chanted. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened, she said, looking at her window at the dear lost day. I don't remember. I will not think about it, she said to her clothes, lying on the chair, and she remembered, as she saw them before, that she had torn them wildly when she went to bed, thinking, I'll fix them in the morning, and a button had fallen from her dress, and she watched it roll under the bed and thought, I'll get that in the morning, I'll face it all in the morning, and in the morning it will be gone. 
he got out of bed, it would be true. If she stayed in bed, she might just possibly be really sick, perhaps delirious, perhaps dead. I will not think about it, she said, and her mind went on endlessly. Will not think about it, will not think about it, will not think about it. Someday, she thought, it will be gone. Someday I will be 60 years old, 67, 80, and I'm remembering will happen. Remembering will perhaps recall that something of this sort happened once, where, when, who, and perhaps I'll smile nostalgically thinking, what a sad, silly girl I was. How worried, uh, how I worried, she would think. Would it have happened again by then? I won't think about it, she said. Won't think about it. Won't think about it. And it keeps going on like that, and I could, Shirley Jackson is a gift to writing, so I could read forever, but we're gonna start unpacking because this isn't an audiobook. So, she wakes up in that moment of calmness and then it's fierce denial. And I guess I sh should say, she doesn't totally forget everything because she does remember tearing her clothes off and seeing the button go under the bed and thinking, I'll take care of it in the morning. Just pushing it, she's pushing it aside. She's pushing it first to the morning to go to bed and then later on pushing it till she's 60 because that's when you will deal with it there's no time now deal with it later she refuses she chants again and again nothing happened she refuses to give whatever happened a name as though it's like as if she names it it means something did happen so she's not going to name it and she consists over and over again i won't think about it i won't think about it i won't think about it but that's, it's tugging at her and it's pulling at her. And that's why she starts amending. I'll remember it one day, but I will remember it one day when it's not a problem anymore. The first time is like, I will remember it in the morning and then I'll go to, so she can go to bed and just basically escape reality. And now it's just cannot remember it, cannot make it true. And there's a sort of fear to confront a new day because if she has to confront this new day, that means she has to confront her continued reality and that this trauma has occurred to her and she does not know how to deal with it. She wants to just deny that it happened and push forward. And how do you do that really? Well, that's why it's repeated so many times, nothing happened, I don't remember, nothing happened, I don't remember, over and over again, she's saying that, it's like, it's a man, it's a mantra to basically kick it out of her memory, forever. Now, and it's not going to work, obviously, or at least if it does work, it's not going to do her any good, because what it is doing is just internalizing what happened. So, it's kind of, it is an it's a very interesting choice to do uh, to write about it with this much ambiguity um the actual assault i should say because the trauma is not ambiguous the trauma in that scene alone is very very apparent but you know the novel and much of shirley jackson's work are often shrouded in ambiguity and this novel is good at like constantly creating this ambiguity especially when it comes to like what is actually happening what is natalie imagining um and this always comes from jackson's inherent desire to her inherent decision to mention but never clarify what happens so you can only speculate what has happened as the reader and in a way as natalie because Natalie's not letting herself remember it. So it's as though she's not totally confronting it. And even though she's treating that like, therefore it didn't happen, it's, there is that bit tugging at her about what could have happened. Because the reader doesn't know, she won't confront it. We just know that it was something that would cause her that much shame. And you, you know, given, the time, this was written in 1951, and given that, it's true that, like, writing a scene with a very explicit sexual assault would have been taboo and probably really damaging to Shirley Jackson's career as a write, as a woman writer, which is a logical reason why did we mention but not clarify what happened. 
But within the text, there is, to me, a further justification about why we don't mention what happened. Because it doesn't matter. It does not ultimately matter what happened or what did not happen. The action is gone in a second, but there is long-lasting trauma that Natalie's consequently internalized. The physical act of the assault will end, the damage does not, especially when she's so mentally vulnerable that she will not even register that she's been traumatized. So Jackson uses this moment for strong characterization. She makes Natalie so severely deny that anything is wrong, she shows her characters having this childishly tragic insistence that she can change her reality. Then Natalie walks downstairs for her family breakfast with her, quote, bruised face and her pitiful, erring body. And the word choice of erring, by the way, is very telling because erring means having failed to adhere to the proper or accepted standards, having done wrong. This word signifies to readers, Natalie now views her body as wrong. It has not adhered to standards. It is wrong. Therefore, she can admit, or she's somewhat aware, something happened to her body that is also causing her this distress. And even though she refuses to let herself acknowledge what causes this feeling of self-disgust, she can't escape its ramifications even in the moment. Natalie is walking evidence of what has happened. Her erring body is erring body is evidence of what has happened. So it's really it's kind of odd to me that I've come across some people who forget that there's the scene in the book or who don't really process what has happened because it is in a way, it, it does happen quickly, because after this chapter, she refuses to keep letting herself think about what happened. However, it's very, it's very telling to me as a way of describing what it's like to go through trauma. It's because, you know, in my Catcher in the Rye video, I talked a little bit about this. There's this idea that if you survive it and you keep going, then you are fine. Because, you know, you do occupy the world in so many ways as though you are fine. You know, you have a, like, you have your health for the most part. You can, you continue to, like, do your day-to-day -day schedule. You survived. Things may have happened, but you are still going. And that's, I've said, that's part of what Holden's issue is. The belief that because he is the inability to reconcile how his past traumas have affected him currently and I see this a lot with Natalie with her inability to reconcile that she that what has happened has left an impact that she cannot escape you know her story and subsequently when she goes to college and she is surrounded by these new faces and she is surrounded by these untrustworthy figures, a lot of her perceptions are distorted by the struggles and her anxieties. And as I mentioned, I mentioned in this in the last video, but there's, again, there's very little reference to what has happened, except when she in the, like, there's this college, like, hazing sort of thing where, or this ritual, whatever you want to call it, um, and they, the older girls are asking the freshman girls, if they are virgins and you know you should say yes or no and natalie says i will not answer and to me that already indicates that she's thinking about what happened to her so even though she will not make the direct correlation or reconciliation of the two now we're gonna jump ahead to the end of the book because I want to also mention, I did say a lot that in the end that she's this more definitive version of who she was and there's that hollow resolution. I think it's interesting when you watch as she's wondering what to do right before she goes back to college, she actually contemplates suicide. 
she wishes like she is away from her friend watch the last video if you need a little bit of an update she's away from her friend she's running away she passes a bridge and she considers jumping over and killing herself and as she's doing it she actually just wishes that her mother would come take her home and it's just it's a very sad m moment where she for the first time ever wants her mother that she doesn't you know for the most part because of the relationship with her father who talks down to her mother a lot she kind of doesn't view her mother that often as a figure she can trust or confide in but so suddenly it's just so sad that she just suddenly wants her mother back and then when the car that takes her home rolls up she thinks it the incredible sight of the car headlights stopped her on the road uh as flat-footed as the car came closer it seemed to her frighteningly that it might be her mother or her father to come look for her then the car stopped the front window rolled down what on earth are you doing out here alone it is my mother natalie thought come to take me home i'm lost i think she said we'll get in the woman said she leaned her seat open natalie climbs in and another thing that i didn't realize until i was just reading that out loud is that she gets into the car not having the total moment of clarity that it's not her mother but that's not even she doesn't register with shock when it's like it's not her mother it's just that she gets in assuming it's still her mother and it sort of does also add to this sense that it's less about wanting her mother and more about wanting a mother figure that she doesn't really have this defined idea of what she wants but she wants somebody to take her home take care of her and yet pages pages later she's going to assert that she's mastered her fears and she is now alone and grown up and powerful and not at all afraid and that's why i say that's a very false victory to me because she has not grown up she is still she's indecisive she's unstable she's one minute contemplating suicide and she's incredibly frail and vulnerable and convincing herself that she has grown up is just another example of her denial and maybe in the moment this denial is going to save her because maybe this is something that is too hard for her to register in the moment but ultimately she's already essentially had her psychotic break but if she has another then it could possibly crumble worse so that's all i want to say for now i may or may not make another video because i feel like i just leave out i just left out a huge chunk of this book to talk about because there's a lot to say when she gets to college um and a lot to say about the professor and about tony um but in the meantime i hope you found this one useful and uh that's all i gotta say i don't know how to say goodbye so bye